Thanks for coming. I realise it is Wednesday afternoon, you've just eaten. You may be a little bit sleepy. I could see some people down the back looking a little bit tired. Um, last year, as Tony said, we tried to build an app in under an hour. I think we almost succeeded. We almost got there. But there was some smoke and mirrors and it looked like we did. Um, this year we're going to try and bite off something maybe simpler or harder. I'm not a lot sure simpler. Which. Definitely a lot We're simpler. going to talk a little bit about feelings. We're going to talk a little bit about business. We're going to talk a little bit about design and development. Um, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, for those who don't know us, Russell is of Pocket Cast uh, fame, which is the best po um, podcast app on Android, iOS, and everywhere, and the web. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark is from a company uh, called Bajango. They do some amazing things. Uh, Mark's a designer there, but I guess the thing they're most known for is ISAP menus, which I saw running in a ton of presentations uh, over the course of the last few days, so that's good. Mark makes a little bit of money from every sale, so he's very excited to, <laughs> to see you all running it. Um, so. I guess we've been doing this since the development side anyway, since about 2008. Yeah, the... both, of us, both companies started at a similar time, so we're very fortunate in that we, um, we came in just as the, well, um, we started a little bit before, but basically I think both of us has, have uh, ridden on the wave of success of the, the iPhone, the smartphone, and just, just the, the recent developments there, and we're very fortunate in terms of timing. Definitely. And, and um, definitely most of this is luck. <laughs> uh, we're not meant to tell people that, Mark. But uh, we've also made a lot of mistakes along the way. We're hoping we can share some of those with you today, um, maybe help people. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing to point out is um, you hear a lot of these types of talks. People are like, oh, I wish I knew this 10 years ago. And um, they tell you about you know, how they've been successful and where they've succeeded and where they've failed. Um, there is no guarantees whatsoever that if you follow all the same steps I did or Mark did, that you'd end up in the same place. You could end up somewhere way better. You could end up somewhere way worse. There is a ton of luck um, involved in this industry. There's a ton of timing. but there's also things that I guess both of us kind of wish we'd known, or maybe just you know tips we want to throw out there that could potentially help one of you, maybe. And if they don't, at least you know you get to sit down and relax for the next 45 minutes, I guess. So I, I guess the first one is um, this was a big one for me because I first started development. I left university in 2001. Um, I was all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. The IT industry was amazing, and there was so much opportunity out there. And I, I guess the last thing I wanted to hear at that point were the the words marketing and uh, networking, because I guess they did feel like dirty words. Um, it, as a developer, you, <laughs> this is what I imagine to be like someone who's into marketing and networking. You know, it's someone in a suit, they're on a beach. Why are they on a beach with a laptop? Nobody knows that's what the world of marketing is like, right? It's, it's, it's very much like that, and it felt like as a developer, like you never wanted to go anywhere near that. You're like, we're free of marketing, we're free of all that kind of thing. The problem is, you realize after having done this, we, um, we started our company on the side in 2008, we went full time in um, 2010. You realize after a while that there actually is something to marketing and networking. Maybe there is not something to lying on a beach with your laptop as the waves come in, not recommended. Um, that will kill the laptop every time, I guarantee it. But there, there is something to be said for it's not enough to build an amazing product. You can build the most amazing product in the world. Um, if no one knows about it, it's not going to go anywhere. And believe me, that is true in 2017. It was maybe a little bit less true in 2008, but things have changed. And so you start having to think about these things. And if you, the idea of marketing is some people think, oh, I'm going to buy a banner advertising on websites and it's going to be everywhere. Is it though? You kind of have to think about um, you know, making relationships with reporters and other companies and potentially partners in the, the same industry you sort of work in and you start having to think about things like synergy. Who loves that word? Synergies. So I can just press here as well. Um, so here's, I guess, a few of the things. Feel free to jump in at any point, Mark, on this one. Um, here's some of the things that we've learned that you can't um, finish coding on the 27th of August, let's say, and then ship your product on the 28th. It doesn't work like that. If you want to have a successful launch, um, you have to put just as much time and investment into the actual launch of a product or an update, if it's like a version two or something, that you did into the actual development. Like, think about how much time you spend agonizing over, uh, should I use a hash map on an array list? Like, should I store this in a MongoDB instance or should I put it in MySQL? Like, we apparently agonize over Mongo, these things. Apparently not Mongo. That's yeah, secure your Mongo yeah. if you yeah, have that out there. Terrible. I really terrible love that. Book. Cardboard cutout, by the way. I'm going to go grab that later on. But um, <laughs> so good, so good, Tim. Um, the, the thing is, like, you, you agonise over that as a developer. You also have to agonise over the launch because what's the point in putting all this effort into the building of your product if you don't also put the same effort into the launch of the product? Um, we found a really cool thing is to try and create a story around a launch. Um, some people might think it was insanely weird that we had launched an Android app 
uh, at a time when Android wasn't successful, let's face it. It was really hard to, to do anything on there. It was, there was no success stories whatsoever. Um, we didn't just pick that platform because we thought it was amazing. We picked it because there was no other stories out there of anyone being successful on the platform. And that, for us, was a, an opportunity. Reporters love that thing. They love, you know, man bites dog rather than dog bites man, the old adage. Um, they love being able to tell a story. And if you can give them something compelling to put on their website that hasn't potentially been on their website before, that's free coverage. That's useful. Um, like I said, you want to plan it as carefully as you plan your code. And I was going to ask Mark here, we generally probably allow two to three weeks for this kind of, we finish coding, and then we start working on how we're actually going to launch this. What kind of stories are we going to tell? What kind of, I hate to say it, but what kind of marketing page are we going to put on the internet? What kind of thing are we going to send to the various um, you know, sites that we work with to actually do a launch? Is it about the same in your experience? Yeah, so we've had the same experience where initially we would just sort of finish something and then you'd be like, upload it. All right, we're done. Let's publish. <laughs> it's out there. And we learned really quickly that that was incredibly stupid and uh, it, just, it just meant all this hard work was almost for nothing because the journalists wouldn't care because they don't care about a product that's already out. They want to know, they want to have enough time to be able to write an article. Um, they, their inboxes are just flooded with new, new products. The worst thing for them to possibly get is this app is already out because they're like, well, what's the story? I've, I've got no time to write it. Everyone else can write a story. Well, what's, what, what am I gaining here? And you, obviously they're, they're looking for content that's exclusive for their website and they want to be in the know early. So um, you, need to, you need to pander to that a bit and you need to make sure that uh, as Russell said, you've got a story and also you give them enough time. So we've certainly started, um, I'd say two weeks for us is hopefully the minimum. That's kind of a rush release. Um, stuff like Scala, the design tool we're working on, I've been working on the launch strategy for that for about six years. So, <laughs> um, that, that's that, what we call in the industry the long game. <laughs> I mean, that's notes. mostly failure in other respects rather than actually, um, you know, because it's just taking a long time to build. But, but yeah, you, you really do need to give people enough time. And obviously with time zones as well, you know, if there's a couple of emails that go backwards and forwards and, and the emails are with the US or something like that, then um, it's, it's just going to take a long time and people could be busy. And so, yeah, you, I think you need, you need to make sure you give, enough, you give yourself enough breathing room and that you, you plan it carefully to, to basically not undo all the hard work you've done. Definitely. And I think one of the last things I want to say about that is... Um, People love reading success stories. You're like, oh, look at this company. They launched this thing. They were so successful. But what they don't love reading about is how they actually got there. It's very rare that you fluke your way to success. Like, you, you have to plan for a launch. Like, it's not magical that a new version comes out and everyone covers it. That person has probably talked to, you know, tens of different reporters. They've given them exclusives. They've said, here, join our beta like a month early, all that sort of thing. These are just things you have to think about as, a, I guess, a developer. Uh, so how many people are designers here in the room? Designers? Not that many. One, one, well, there's a couple, a couple. Um, of the designers, of the, four, <laughs> of the four people here who are designers, um, how many of you use Git for design stuff or use Git at all? Yeah? Okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, so I don't, probably don't really need to talk too much about this because you all know what Git is anyway. Um, Git is awesome, and I'm, I'm, my mission in life is to try and get more and more designers to use Git because obviously developers understand the, the benefits and, and all the, um, you know, the version control allows you to make mistakes easily, allows you to collaborate, and that's just really unusual in the design world. And part of that is because of the, the tooling doesn't allow for it in a good way yet. Um, but another part is because Git seems kind of scary. Um, for those who don't know Git, and you know, this is sort of how I initially saw it, I had used Subversion a little bit via command line before I started using Git, um, but to me this is what Git was, and um, Russell can now explain exactly what this does, because I don't quite know. To be honest, know. I've never actually run Rebase, so I have no idea what that does. We should just skip straight over that part. Right, right, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> So my advice to designers, and, and, and for, for the developers in the room, obviously it's developer strong here, there aren't that many designers. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to push them to use Git and, and basically say it's like Dropbox with comments or whatever. Um, I, I think developers should play a role here and, and be trying to push designers into using Git because it's not that hard and they should be part of the team collaborating on the, on the repository. Um, because really it's not that hard, especially GitHub for Mac, super simple. It's really like one sync button. I don't know if most people, actually who uses uh, Source Tree here? Yeah, 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 lots of people. Uh, Tower? Boo. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably given the audience, probably not that many people using GitHub for Mac. No. That was oh, a few. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, anyway, this is my favorite. This is, Russell doesn't like it, but it's okay. Source Tree, just a million times better. What are you going to do? Um, and <laughs> Obviously, one of the biggest things that I want to, again, that you can re relate to the designers you work with, um, it's, it's 
almost impossible to make mistakes using Git, right? You don't need to know much. Um, you can obviously discard your local changes when you break things, which I do. I probably do this once a day. Um, you can reclone the whole entire rep repository, which I do really frequently as well, because I'll just I'll go into the X Xcode and start breaking stuff, and then I'll realize what I've done is really terrible and very embarrassing, and I don't want to share that with the uh, developers. So I'll just, like, I'll just delete, reclone, it's fine. So it's again, this is something I really want to relay to designers that um, Git is awesome. Everyone should be invited into the, the repo. So please, please, please don't feel uh, like you should be protecting your... Um, Yes. This is a key one, because I noticed most of you are developers here. How many developers' hands up actually let their designers into their Git repo? And I'm not talking about separate Git repos, I'm talking about the actual one. That's maybe half of the yeah, people it's a who few, originally... It's a few. That's not bad, but there, there is that hesitation of like, this is my repository, and uh, you know, smart people are allowed only, like no designers like in this, <laughs> in this space. But the thing is like, you, it doesn't, designers are actually smart people, I joke. Like, you can sit them. It's you a different kind them. of smart, right? It's a, it's a special kind a of special smart. smart. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can sit them down in front of the tools and say, look, like, there's literally no mistakes you can make here. Like, if you absolutely mess everything up, we can press the undo button. Don't worry about it. Here's the tools, like, actually make some changes. And you see a little light bulb go off. And I think Mark's had this experience as well when you show a designer that. that this is not a developer tool. It's, it's a versioning tool. Like it has, almost has nothing to do with development, really. It's just a way of snapshotting things. And there's no reason you can't let your designers straight into your Git repository to change assets, to even modify stuff in like Interface Builder if, if they need to. I know Mark does a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. And we, as you can see, we used um, Git exclusively for this talk. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, we actually tried. We tried using um, the Keynote collaboration. and. We backed away from that pretty quickly. So anyway, that's, I just thought that was funny because we were oh, I was doing the slides for the Git stuff. I'm like, yeah, here's final underscore. To be fair, though, I think someone told me the ports that Git uses, the default ports are actually blocked in here. So that's our excuse, yeah? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yep, block yep. ports, block ports. Um, yeah, and so part of this obviously relates to letting designers onto the repository is um, I wish I'd do this at the start. Xcode, I don't need to actually write code to use Xcode or to be part of the project. And, and that, that, that was a fairly shocking revelation when it happened. Um, and, and I can easily set up all the kind of stuff that would be really tedious work for developers with what is fairly native to me and, and quite easy to, to set up. So um, I like editing constraints now in Interface Builder. It's cool. It's not that hard, especially if they're already set up and all you're doing is changing some values to nudge things around. That's, that's really menial work that um, the amount of effort I would have to go to to even explain the change to a developer uh, is, takes way longer than me just going in and changing it and then submitting the, committing the change. And if, if I break something, I'll just go, ah, I broke this. Go on, can you fix it for me? <laughs> um, and again, you, you start to learn the, the um, the native abilities of the platform, so it's it's good in that respect, in that you you know more in tune with the um. With yeah, the I mean we've had our designer before we showed him these kind of tools. Um, we've had him build things that were not impossible to build, but you're talking three months of development time versus two days of development time. And um, at a company like ours, we don't have three months to work on a lot of things unless they're super secret sort of important things. Um, so sometimes you can just show them the constraints of the tool. Just so they know, like, you know, if you do this, two days, if you do this, three months, think about that during the design process. And even better if you actually let them go and tweak stuff themselves, like Mark's saying. Which is cool, because you can build up credit, too, like, in, in that kind of interaction. Um, uh, the designer could say, okay, this time, you can do, you can do it the easy way. <laughs> this once, I'm going <laughs> to let you but, but I'll take some credit for that, and then... Um, and yeah, they do. When, the, when there's something that's really in, crucial that you actually... Uh, is, is valuable, is more valuable to the product from a design sense. You can cash those chips in and say, guess what you're working on for the next month? Um, here's another example. So uh, this is actually, this is Scala. This is some of the styles set up for Scala. Um, I, I was speaking to the developer, and like, I, I've got, we've got some, we had a bit of, a, we've got a bit of a mess in that we've been uh, working very quickly, so we've got a whole bunch of styles spread across the entire app, and we wanted to kind of consolidate that, um, as, as is normal, you know, when you start working on stuff, it kind of spreads out, and then you can group it all back together at the end and make it a bit more organized. So. Um, I spoke to the developer, I'm like, can we just, can we set up some stuff? Can you just let me know what, what I need to do? And, and from that, we've built a, a style-based file. It's just, obviously, um, for designers, this is pretty similar to CSS, really. It's not that different, but obviously it's Swift code. Uh, and that means the developer can now use all those styles and hook them up, and then I can just go and tweak them as much as I want. And this is, this is kind of, in the project, this is my code file that I, I, I can maintain. Yeah. So. And if, if you haven't been developing for long or you don't do this, this is a really good idea. So if you find yourself, you're an interface builder, 
uh, manually putting in colors like hex codes or whatever, um, that is really the wrong place to enter like any sort of style information. Um, you are way better off using like, the technology doesn't matter, you can use a plist, you can have like a, a Swift file, you can have whatever, whatever, some central place that you're like, okay, the default text color is this color under this theme, it's like a slightly different color. If you standardize all of that into one place, what it actually means is um, when you want to support something like theming, so there's a lot of rumors that you know, Apple will one day release like a, a dark theme for iOS. So a dark theme is sometimes a cool thing to have just in general. If you've consolidated all those styles into one place, then it's really easy to implement something like a dark theme. You just put a few extra like methods or whatever in, put all the colors in, you're done. You don't have to worry about going into every single interface builder file and being like blue, red, green. It's like it's not, that's not how development works. And not only that, um, now you mentioned that, the color picker in, in Interface Builder, um, depending on what you're working on, there's a whole bunch of color space gotchas where you may enter a value and uh, due to color space conversions, it won't end up that exact value in the, the running app. Um, there's just a whole bunch of issues there, so it's probably better to have this week and it's a bit more known. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so my message again is, is really, um, for the designers, uh, you, you can do it, it's not that hard. If you've already written some CSS, it's, it's really quite similar and you've got obviously a lot of smart people around, a lot of smart developers to help you out with that and really all you're doing is tweaking some values, so it's, it's pretty easy. Um, and for the developers, please, please, please let the designers onto the repository. Uh, it, it will make a huge difference to your life, it'll make your life a lot easier because they can, um, you're empowering them to do a lot of the boring work that you don't like anyway. So. Why, why wouldn't you let them do that? Yeah, you'll be surprised. Designers love doing like manual tasks. You just hand them off. It's good. <laughs> um, this is a bit of a, a different one. This is more about, I guess, running a company, which some of you want to do, some of you don't want to do. I understand that. Um, this is something I struggled with for a long time. Is I guess since 2010, I've technically been a boss. You know, I run a company. I'm a director of a company. Um, we have employees, and I've never been comfortable with that relationship because I don't see myself as as someone's like, you know, manager or boss or whatever. And for the first few years, I'm like, we can be friends. We're all like family. Like, oh, I'm, I know you're like, I'm your boss or whatever, but don't call me your boss. Like, we can go out to lunch, we can do whatever. You realize, and this is like a, a tough lesson to learn. Um, again, thanks to Mark for some amazing PowerPoints that he's uh, managed to dig up. But um, you learn that sometimes that delineation is actually important. And I'm not talking about lording it over people. I'm not talking about statuses. I'm not talking about hierarchies. But what I found in the early days is whenever one of my employees would introduce me to their partner or like a friend or someone who came to visit the office, they would always say, this is my boss, Russell. And that would make you really uncomfortable. I'm like, I'm not your boss. But you realize after a while that it's actually not an equal relationship from their perspective. Um, you control their pay. You control whether they're employed or not. Um, to some extent, you control the kind of work they do. So I think you have to actually become comfortable with that relationship that you can't be someone's best friend, you can't be there. You can still be like friendly with them, but you, it's, it's not good to try and make everyone like you, I guess, is, is where I'm going. That's not what being a boss is about. So I think some of the things that actually being a good boss is about is empowering people to do the work they need. So one policy we have at Shifty Jelly is whatever your computer you want, no matter how ridiculous, we will buy it for you. Like if you want a Mac Pro, we'll buy you a Mac Pro. If you want... Wait, what? Yeah, that's true. If you want to fight, because <laughs> do you have any job openings? <laughs> think about it. Like, you're, we don't have many employees. We have five, right? So that's one of our most valuable assets. And to spend ten grand of a, on a computer, like, who cares? If that makes their job better, if they want to run Linux, they can run Linux. Like, we don't. You know care what Apple had promised for 2018, right? It's like new displays. Yeah, new Mac we, we got a problem with the Mac Pro coming out and all that. Yeah, maybe we should revise this. But um, the the thing is, like, that's how, and you empower them to also do the work. So we don't mandate. Um, the tools you need to use, we don't mandate any particular tool jam. We try and standardize a little bit, but if there's some way you want to work as a developer, I think that's a way more important thing for a boss to understand that I don't, I don't have to micromanage your life. That's a bad boss in my opinion. Like A good boss is someone who gives you enough freedom, I guess, to do the things you want to do without giving you too much freedom to sort of drive the car into a, a tree. Is that a really bad analogy? Probably is. Um, <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying? Like It's, it's not about being the, the person's best friend. It's about being for them at being there as a boss to kind of help them, you know, through their career and actually, you know, do meaningful work and have fun at the same time. But it's it's not about being best buds, I don't think. Like to that's like an employment thing at the end of the day. I don't know if you have any thoughts there. I think it's great just to work with smart people and then get out of their way and let yeah. them, you know, uh, that's really, a good if someone has, it. if you're hiring someone as an expert, um, just listen to them. I mean, that's really kind of the only boss yeah. tip I've got. I don't really have any other boss <laughs> tips. We, we work remotely, so I don't really see people that often. This is one of my favorite ones, by the way. Yeah, so I, 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 
obviously, um, it's very common on the internet to argue about tooling, and people have strong opinions. Um, one, one thing I've, I've noticed is that early on, I um, obviously to get good at a certain tool, you have to be uh, very specific, and you probably have to restrict yourself just to using one thing. But something I'm finding personally is that I, um, I'm really enjoying, and I'm getting a lot out of diversifying the amount of tools I use, and and understanding sort of when to use different things. Um, and I've been making a very, very conscious effort to, to sort of get all the design tools, buy them all, use them all, and, and try to understand where they're, where they're good and they're bad. Um, this is a recent test I did because we were building some uh, Android vector drawables. And as part of that, um, obviously being kind of more of a technical designer, I really like having a, a good pipeline for, for pushing stuff through so you know um, what the result's going to be and you can get it in a reproducible way. Again, because we're small, we kind of don't have time to do things manually or to, to make a lot of mistakes, which I try and get this stuff right. So this is a quick test. Um, out of this test, I kind of, I preferred, given what you need for vector drawables, um, I actually preferred Affinity Designer, which is a little bit strange because it's not a tool I use very often, um, but it's cheap. I bought it anyway, and it's good for some things. Um, here's something else. Uh, I don't know if anyone follows me on Twitter. This is a shameless <laughs> plug. But, so this is, this is me using uh, Illustrator to draw an icon. Um, and this is, it's, it's a very difficult icon to create, and in Illustrator, it's not that hard. It comes with, it's got a whole bunch of tools that are really useful for, for creating this little fingerprint icon. Um, in, I actually don't know how I'd even create this in most other design tools. It's a lot of really unique Illustrator features. Illustrator is just ridiculously powerful when it comes to vector editing. So I do a lot of my icon design in Illustrator. Um, but again, a lot of that's come from the, the idea of trying to use a diverse range of, of tools. Um, there we go. It's almost wow. finished. It's like magic. There you go, it's finished. But, oh. <laughs> um, but there's a caveat. You know, all tools have limitations. Illustrator is really, really, really terrible at certain things, like just rendering stuff. It's just shockingly bad. So I don't use it to generate any real assets except um, vector stuff occasionally. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, th I think that's something, again, the, the whole idea of this talk is to speak to your younger self. And my, my, what I'd be saying to my younger self is, don't be so snobby about the tools, don't be so opinionated about tools. Most of them have a, a good use. It's just a matter of um, understanding them well enough to, to know when to employ their use. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as I said, Illustrator has some good points and some very, 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 very bad points. And I've reported this to the team Years ago, it's not going to get fixed. Years ago, years ago. <laughs> I mean, but the same thing is true of development. Like we, we love to argue about tabs, <laughs> spaces. I mean, honestly, who cares? Like the IDE handles all that. I don't care what what format it's in, as long as it looks the same on um, everyone's computer. It's the same with languages. I see people like, oh, if I could just get Swift to run on my server, my life would be complete. Like there are way better technologies to be running on a server than than Swift. Like Swift is designed for iOS coding and Mac coding. It is perfect for that. It's an amazing language. One day it might also be an amazing server language. That's what it's designed for. But you kind of got to pick the best tool for the best job. Like we um, we deployed a web server literally, I think last week. Um, we wrote the entire thing in Kotlin, um, and we deployed it to like a Java JVM -y type thing. And I know that makes people really cringe in here. They're like, oh, you deployed Java code, but you know what? Um, things like that are proven on the server side. It, that thing, I think, currently gets 120 requests a second. Um, it fulfills most of them in like about one millisecond, I think, total, and that's round tripping stuff like to a database and back. Um, you got to pick the right tools for the right job. It's often not worth arguing about, oh, should we do this particular thing in this language or that language? Like, we don't, I guess, once you've been developing for a while, all languages kind of start to look the same. Like, that they have their own quirks and weirdnesses, but Often you just got to be like, what's the most solid, stable language we can pick for this particular thing? Let's use that. If we have to pick a different language over here, it's not that hard for developers to learn new language. You know, there's a little bit of, of sort of, you know, time. Do you think that's tough? So imagine your younger self. Would you try and recommend sticking to one thing, but but keeping in the back of the mind, you'd have to learn more later? Oh, a younger Russell would have argued that there was only one language that you could possibly use, and, you know, and what's you that? Oh, well, it was Java for a while, and it was Objective C. It was whatever the flavor of the month was, basically. Like, but. I think when you first start off, it's better to just learn one language and learn it solidly. But I think after a few years of development, like it, you should just be learning like as many languages as it takes to do your job, I guess. It's, it's not worth restricting yourself to one and then having to jump through hoops to try and use that language to, to be somewhere where it wasn't designed to go. Like, I would never build, ever, ever, ever build a Java UI because as fun as Swing is, it makes really terrible UIs. Like, it's not, it, it's designed for that, but it's terrible at that. So I'd, I'd never deploy it for that.
<laughs> this is one of my favorites. So this is um, actually how many how many people here would say that they're independent developers who are working on their own products and there's enough money coming out of that so they can pay their rent. I've got and, a simple a simple way to ask that and, question. Does yeah. your bank think you're self-employed? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have trouble getting a mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> so I see Quinton up there. There's maybe like one or two other people. The, the point is um, the, the market is such that being an independent developer is actually really hard and it's actually uncommon. Like uh, myself, Mark, Quinton, and maybe like three other people in this room do it. It's not because we're especially talented or anything. It's just because it's a hard thing to do. And we kind of lucked, lucked into it. But the thing is like everyone has this picture in their head when they talk to me, they're like, oh, you left your full-time job, that must be amazing. You now have unlimited time and you have no constraints. You have, no one tells you like you have to use this language or this framework. No one mandates Oracle for your backend or whatever. Like, and you just, you must have so much time. You know, you, you wanna go and like sit on a boat for three months, you go and sit on a boat for three months and you relax. But that's, that's kind of the picture I had in my head as well. Back in 2010, um, we had an app this called, picture? this picture, this exact picture. Um, <laughs> We had an app called Pocket Weather Australia. It was really successful on iOS. I think by 2012, we had 450,000 downloads of like a $2 app. And that's something that we just built like ourselves on the couch. And that was amazing. This was before we went full time. And then in 2010, we're like, we're going to do this. We're going to be these exciting people like leaping off. Are they leaping off buildings? Is that? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe, maybe, is, where maybe is the this image isn't what we imagined it to no, be. But, maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Like, you imagine it's going to be this wonderful thing. And I will tell you right now that going into business for yourself and being an independent developer is, it's a lot of things, but it's not unlimited time and it's not uh, no constraints. It is all about constraints because your constraint is how big your company is, um, the kind of things you can do. And I tell you what, like seven years later, everything takes longer than you think it will. Like there was a feature we were going to launch. Like if you had asked me six months ago, I will tell you it was launching three months ago and it, it obviously hasn't because I'm not here to talk about it today. So. It's just constantly that kind of stuff. You've got to pick where you put your effort and your resources. And it's, it's sometimes very tiring to try and keep on top of that. I, I'm sure Mark finds that as well. Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, it's, it's really rough. I mean, I, I guess the difference is that there'd be, um, in, in a, in a full-time job, there'd be things you'd be complaining about that would be uh, management decisions or whatever. Now that's you. So that's, <laughs> now you're the one making the, the, the tough decisions that feel uncomfortable yeah. that, you know. Whenever people ask me, like, um, you know, what's your boss like? You know, what's he like? I'm like, man, that guy's the biggest jerk like I've <laughs> ever met in my entire life. Um, so this one's obviously something I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I think it's something that everyone should care about because there's, there's a whole bunch of gotchas that are coming. If you haven't been hit by them yet, you're going to be. Um, so color management is super, super, super important, always has been, except uh, because of the, the new devices that are coming out, obviously all new iOS, or maybe not obviously, all new iOS devices are, well, the, Apple are still selling a lot of old iOS devices that aren't, but the new, new, new good ones are um, all display P3, so they're wide gamut. Uh, the new Android phones are, are typically OLED, is almost, because of the way the tech works, it's sort of almost wide gamut by default, that's just how it works. Um, for those who don't know what color management is, actually, how many people know, think they know what color management is? Yes, a few, a few. Okay, cool, that's all right. Um, it, it's, it's, what you're actually doing is you're taking a color value and you're giving it a, a color space that it exists in. Um, I've got a simpler way of explaining it, possibly. Um, so if, so if Russell asked me to build a table, and these were his Build me a table, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Please. And these were, these were Russell's instructions. Um, I'm like, okay, cool, that works, that works. It's 50, 50 long legs. Um, what does 50 mean? Is it 50 kilometers? Probably not, because it's like a coffee table. Uh, 50 inches, um, well not, not Australia, I hope it wouldn't be inches, but the, 50 inches would be too small. 50 millimeters would be way, way, way too small. I actually small. did want a table for ants. Just <laughs> <laughs> actually, we've got one here. It's the table nano. Um, so what we have here is the 50 is the value and, and centimeters is the, the unit space. This is pretty much essentially what color management is. This is, this is all you really need to know. Um, so if you've got a color value, the, you, you need the unit space as well to say uh, what, this, what space this belongs to so that you can associate that color with an absolute physical real world thing that it means you can have two devices showing a color and it looks the same. That's, that's really all it is. So um, most people know if you've done a lot of uh, web or, or, or native development, um, they know that you need the value and obviously the values can be written a whole bunch of different ways. Um, what they don't necessarily know that is that, that this is um, sometimes inferred by whatever tech you're using, but this is actually changing. This whole uh, sRGB 
thing, sRGB stands for standard RGB, and it has been mostly kind of standard. Um, but because we now have wide gamut everything, TVs, phones, computers, the whole lot, um, this is no longer assumed, and, and you're going to have to be more specific in the future. Um, this, I'm going to try and quickly demo what I mean, because it's not quite the same as um, actually just saying centimeters. So when we say something's in a certain color space, um, what that means is it's not just like centimeters, which is a unit scale that has a, has a length, and that's, that's pretty much all you need to know about it. There's a whole bunch of other parameters that define a color space, and what you really end up with is kind of a, um, a 3D hull thing. And if a color is in, so what we have here is the colored region is um, sRGB, so it's the old standard um, RGB. Any color that is inside that could be defined in, in sRGB, and the, the white region around that is, um, that's display P3. So basically, when you're defining colors in the future, or even possibly now, you need to attach them to a color space so that the system can know an absolute physical color um, that it belongs to. And this is important if you want things to, to look right. And as Russell was saying before about using uh, Interface Builder, um, Interface Builder, the, the Mac color picker has some, it's, it's not quirks, it's, it's kind of, there you go, I'm ranting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not quirks, but, but the color picker, you can actually choose the, um, the, the, the color space you're working in, in the picker. And most people don't know this because it's like a little hidden menu and it's only on some of the tabs. And what Interface Builder will do is, is, is it'll say, well, your display is in this color space. You're probably picking your colors in the display's color space. By the way, iOS is standard, uh, by standard is, um, is sRGB, so I'm just going to convert it for you. And uh, if, if anyone's ever had values change, like uh, um, does, where a designer's given you some images and the images may not match the colors in code, this is probably why. And there's a whole bunch of gotchas like that. So you kind of need to be a little bit more aware of that as a, um, as a developer and, and also designers. Um, and again, this, this is super important and it hasn't been as important in the past because sRGB has been kind of the default everywhere. But um, now that is, is definitely changing. And uh, if you haven't seen these issues, um, actually, anyone who's used Slack, Slack uh, uses um, uh, Electron, which is Chrome browser. Chrome, um, it is actually color managed in the Canary builds now, I think, um, but the current uh, version that's being used for Electron isn't. So if you've ever used Slack and dragged some images across and, and noticed that they're like super saturated or if other things are going on, that's because it's not color managed uh, and it means basically people are not seeing what they should be seeing. So yeah, it's. You've got, to, you've got to be aware of this stuff. <laughs> so please please read up on it if you don't know about it already. Um, oh, yeah. So here's uh, just the, the future of the web. You probably, anyone who's written CSS probably may not have seen this. Has anyone seen this? That's, no? So this is actually defining a color in a color space. Um, the the uh, WC3 is, I think, discussing how they're going to implement this right now. Um, it, it's not, I don't think it's implemented in any browser yet, but the WebKit team, this is their proposed solution. So P3 would be display P3. So in the future, I think we're going to be defining colors in color spaces in CSS. Um, I think, Russell, is this how you do it in, on iOS? Something like this? Ah, uh, it's pretty close, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> close enough, Mark. I, I think, I think enough. you have CG context and you give it a context, a color space. Um, and on Android, it's something like this as well. So uh, again, the P3 for display P3, which is kind of what a lot of the wide gamut um, displays are. Nice. And uh, Mark's right. Like That's becoming increasingly important. As, as a developer, I've never really cared about color management before because I'm like, why, why do you care? Like It's just, that's up to the designer. But if the designer gives you a picture and then you deploy it and it looks completely different, like that can actually ruin like large parts of your app if you, if you don't get that right. It's important to get right. I mean, you, you sweat all the other details. Why not, why not sweat that one? Um, so this is another one, I guess, that comes with not just being an independent developer, but being any sort of developer in any sort of industry where um, you have some control of release dates. And often what happens is if you have customers, and we do, we have millions of customers, um, they like to see updates. This is what customers like. It's weird. You wish, you wish you could just put a version out there like, and just leave it for like 10 years and you're like, that's all you need. Like It's the perfect app. You don't need anything else. But customers want features and they'll send you support requests, send you feature requests. Um, they'll hit you up on Twitter or wherever. So and I have a question for you. I'm yes, interject. go for it. So what is the shortest amount of time from an update where someone's complained that there haven't been any updates? 
Uh, I reckon one time it was three weeks. Someone looked it up, um, and this is this is to do with the whole WWDC Google I/O thing. But it was three weeks after WWDC. They're like, "Well, I haven't you implemented this thing. I've got the beta. Like, where is it?" I'm like, "What? You got beta one? Like, slow down, slow down." And I think since both companies now, Google and Apple, have started doing public betas, I think that's actually starting to get slightly. Worse. Yeah, because stuff breaks. And there's more people using yeah. the betas, and yeah. but the, the weird part for me is that that's that's a bit weird. That's like an outlier. But sometimes it'll be three months. And someone will go, is your app abandoned? What's happened? It's been, I'm like, it's just three months. Like, settle down. We're working on things. Have you found the same thing? Yeah, yeah exactly the same thing where people say, is it abandoned? What's happened? What's happened? There's been no updates. <laughs> and we're like, it's, is it working? Yeah, it's working. But have you abandoned it? It's like, what do you want? I don't care. I don't know. I don't know what new features I want. But has it been abandoned? No. <laughs> That's it's my fine, favorite one it's as well. Fine. But they're like, when are you yeah. going to update it? And I'm like, what feature would you like to see? They're like, oh, nothing in particular. Just want to know when you're going to update it. And I'm like, what, what do you think an update is? That's, that's, <laughs> add some spaces to a code file, rebuild. <laughs> it's tempting. I often wonder if that's what Facebook and other companies do because they crank out something every two weeks and they just tell you bug fixes and improvements. You're like, did you actually change anything? I don't know. Um, uh, but the thing is, it's very tempting, and we did this a lot in the early days, is that when customers are demanding stuff, especially if you know it's stuff you've got in the pipeline, it's very tempting to put out a release date because you want to placate them. You want to be like, it's currently July. Uh, we're shipping in, the, in September, and you might think you've given yourself like two or three weeks buffy, like, actually, we're going to be finished end of August, but if we tell them September, we'll be fine. Um, don't do that, is my advice, if you can at all avoid it. I know sometimes you can't, but if you can, um, it's better not to give out release dates because things go wrong. You come across some um, development bugs, you come across server bugs, you come across just other things that you might sort of take your time. And if you've given out release dates, suddenly you feel the pressure to actually meet those release dates because why wouldn't you? You've told people, and what happens? We've done this, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, you put out something that's not quite ready. And I think sometimes you know it's not quite ready, but there's just so many demands and there's so much pressure to ship on a particular day, especially before Christmas or before some big event and stuff like that. And all that happens is now your customers, they were angry at you before for missing a deadline. Um, they're now double angry at you because you've given them something that doesn't work properly. And suddenly, this is your support people. They're like, oh my goodness, look at our inbox and our Twitter and all these other places. Like, you can, you can literally make a big mess just by releasing something on time, which makes a lot of sense and yet doesn't make a lot of sense. You think we've shipped on time. What's, what's the problem, people? Yeah. This is where we get to um, reuse this next slide. Woo, it's rant time. Uh, I want to tell you a real story about this. So this one's uh, a little bit personal for me, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, like I said, we had this insanely successful weather app. Um, 450,000 downloads, you know, paid update. We did the whole paid update thing. Successful again. Hundreds of thousands of people downloaded it. Um, and then we got to working on version 5, and Swift was out. Um, it was like Swift 1.0 or 2.0 back then. And we got all excited. We're like, we're going to rewrite this whole app in Swift. It's going to be amazing. Um, we hired a really talented developer, um, a guy from Melbourne, to, to work with us for six months before he was, he was moving on somewhere else. Um, and we were like, we're going to build the most amazing app ever. It's going to be awesome. And we may have started promising people release dates. So we'll say, don't worry, it'll be shipped before the end of the year. Because people were asking, you know, where's the update? Where's the update? Where's the update? Um, and what happened? We got to the end of the year. There was a whole bunch of unexpected sort of developments along the way. And nothing to do with, by the way, the particular skill of the developer involved or anything like that. It's everything from the development side, like, you know, the, the code is good, like the whole project is good. But we got to December. And I don't know if you know, but the App Store shuts around the 21st or something like that, 17th. I can't remember what the date is of December. And you have a two-week window or so where you can't submit any new apps. And we're like, oh, we're going to hit this deadline. So we cut a whole bunch of features. We cut, I think, themes. We cut some cards. We cut some other rearranging functionality. And we're like, OK, we've cut some features. We did one day of testing. Uh, we're just, it's the 17th or whatever the deadline is. Let's just ship this thing and go and have fun at like Christmas time. And we thought it was okay. We weren't quite sure. We're like, eh, we've done one, one day of testing. It's fine. We put it out there and it's probably not an exaggeration to say that we, we kind of ruined that product. We, um, at that point we had a particular sales level. We probably went down to one tenth of that sales level just after releasing the update. Um, we went from about 4.8 stars out of 5 on average to like 1.5. Uh, we ticked off a lot of people because not only did we change the user interface, we introduced a whole bunch of bugs. There were some features missing that were originally in there and didn't ship. And I kid you not, like had we just waited for two or three weeks, maybe even a month, people would have been angry that we missed the deadlines we promised them. But I guarantee you they would have been a whole lot less angry than like actually shipping the thing.
So that, that's a valuable lesson. Like this stuff happens like in real life. It does. It's happened to us too. I mean, we didn't have the same, we didn't promise a deadline because we've, we've been burnt by that in the past with other products and we now know just to, to be quiet, which is kind of weird because if someone asks you a really direct question, like, is there a new version coming out? When's it coming out? And you're like, I can't tell you that because, well, because I don't know, but also um, because I know the repercussions of, of, of saying that. So this case for us at Menus 4, that was a really bad release for us. Um, we had a lot of other pressure, a little bit of financial pressure because again, small company, this is our income. Um, we had to get it out because we we're kind of running a little bit low. Um, and we just released it too early. It would have been another, another two, three weeks would have been great. That would have made all the difference. Uh, we didn't have a very big beta group, which again is something we've learned to do. You should really try and right towards the end anyway, have a really big, big beta group and then not have a deadline. Yeah. Um, we're just about to actually, well, we're starting to beta iStep Menu 6 now. So we're, we're doing the same thing where we're trying to have a big beta group and catch all the bugs. Um, iStep Menu 4, we, it was a really bad two weeks. We had so many bugs. We'd um, removed some features as well because we'd rewritten components and, and we just dropped some stuff and people were really angry about that because they, they liked it in the past. It's like, which is cool because it's good to have very passionate people using your, your product. But um, obviously they get pretty ticked off if you remove things on them. Uh, so yeah, after about two, three weeks, we, we thankfully didn't ruin the product, but um, we, we did have a lot of very long days and a lot of catching up and it kind of it, it lost us a lot of goodwill. So that was, that was not so good. And we, we learned a lot for iStep Minis 5 and hopefully again for 6, we're going to be a little bit smarter about it. But yeah, it's not good. Yeah, I think the other thing about that is it's not always success stories. Like there are actual failures. And if you're not having failures and you're doing something wrong, you're probably not actually pushing yourself to, to do cool new things, I guess. Yep, yep. Uh, so the next point I'd like to talk about is that uh, you can't really optimize for all outcomes. And this is another mistake we've made where we've, we've thought uh, we want... A lot of people using our thing because that's good anyway you kind of build up momentum and there's more people talking about it and you might be um, more likely to be able to um, get some kind of press or tweets or whatever else you need to, to have a successful launch um, but you also obviously we're given what we are we need income for, for our app so we have to also uh, charge some kind of price um, oh, this is yeah obviously you have to navigate the uh, the maze to success it's very, very important <laughs> Um, They're very abstract, some of these pictures. And this is my incredibly scientific uh, diagram <laughs> based on years of research. Um, so we've we found that we've really struggled when we've tried to uh, create something that actually lets us eat, um, but also gets to a lot of people. And we've, we've found that if you try and do both at the same time, and I think the entire um, iOS developer community has learned this, that like 99 cent apps are just a terrible idea. And they're probably never good. We we're just really fortunate that there was some kind of magical rush at the start that sort of made it work for a while. Um, we, we found that it really, if you're trying to actually um, get to a lot of people, uh, you should just make the thing free, like if that's, if that's really what you want to do. Um, in terms of roadblocks, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of products. I don't know why they do this, but they they have like email forms, and they'll email you a download link, or they will email you a link to try and build a database, um, or even swap it for like a tweet. You know, you you can have this thing as long as you tweet. Um, they're terrible ideas. If you're trying to optimize to actually get to a lot of people, uh, that's just going to basically stop most of the people from from actually fulfilling that. Um, I really love open source. I've kind of, it's been a weird thing because it's mostly, mostly a developer thing. It's normally code that's open source. I've been trying really hard to make sure we've um, got a lot of uh, templates and other resources that are open source and also on a, obviously a really, really uh, great license like BSD or MIT to just let people do whatever they want. You really, if you're gonna give something away, give it away properly and, and let the world have it. Um, and if you actually want it, you're trying to do this to eat, um, ask for money, like ask for a reasonable amount, make sure the transaction is, is really transparent. It's like, this is what you get when you give us this um, and try to live up to your promises. And like we're saying with the, re the release deadlines, uh, don't make promises you can't keep because yeah. they'll upset people. It's funny how obvious that one is. Like a lot of people are searching for new business models, you know, subscription, in-app purchase, whatever. Um, so sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's just worth asking for what you think your app is worth. Like at one stage, Pocket Cast was $2. Uh, we raised the price to four dollars, and then later to like five dollars. We didn't see any dip in sales, like at all. Like we just like this is what the product's worth. It is never discounted. It is never getting cheaper. It's only getting more expensive, and people seem to be happy with that. It's a very simple transaction. Is it worth five dollars? Yes or no. Um, we, we're getting towards the end now, but um, uh, this is one that is really near and dear to my heart because because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible programmer. No. Um, it's because what, what do junior 
programmers fear the most? They fear the compiler. That thing is freaking scary. Like there's red things and it's like no and type systems and things they didn't teach you in university or TAFE or like whatever book you sort of learned development from. Um, school of Stack Overflow. <laughs> the School of Stack Overflow, I like that one. Um, the, the thing is like you fear the compiler and you fear all your peers because unless you're some kind of egomaniac, presumably you know that you're fresh to the industry and you don't know a lot of stuff. And so you're terrified of showing your peers your code. Like a code review is like the worst thing in the world because people are going to pick it apart. And I'll never forget, um, I got my first uh, job. This was in the defense sector. The, don't read too much into that. There's, the entire defense industry runs on like things that I've been involved in. But um, <laughs> the thing is like- With I, bad code. Yeah, bad, very bad code. But I'll never forget my first code review. I sent it off to my tech lead at the time. I got a hundred comments back and I kid you not, that's demoralizing. Like, and because it, you think it's all about you, you think they're personally attacking you. And there was, trust me, there was no personal attacks whatsoever in this code review. It was literally like, this is not how you do this. We do this. Like, this is not how you do this. We need to comment this. Like, it was all good comments, but when you get that volume of feedback back, your initial reaction is to get all defensive. You're like, oh, that's really scary. And the problem is later on you become an experienced programmer. And suddenly you think there's nothing to fear because you're perfect and your code is perfect and you followed all the design patterns and you've got observer observable, consumer producer, uh, you know, you've got your reactive stuff, you've got all this other stuff, you've picked the framework you want and you're a genius, like no one can question your decisions. Um, that's actually a really bad place to be in as well. And um, I think as a senior developer, hopefully the, the place you're trying to get to, and there's no timelines here, by the way, you can progress through these as fast or as slow as you want, but I think the real place you've got to get to is not being too precious about your code. It's, it's just code. Everybody writes code, everybody writes good code, everyone's bad code. Something you think is amazing today might look like absolute rubbish uh, in a year's time. Something you think is really rubbish today might actually turn out to be a really good solution to the problem like a year from now. You're like, oh, I've done this thing before. Um, the thing is, don't worry about it. Like, I've always been really terrified of open sourcing any of my stuff because I'm like, people are going to be looking at what I've written. And my new goal for um, sort of the next 12 months is just to open source a whole bunch of stuff because everyone who's done it tells me it's the opposite. You learn stuff. You put stuff out there, people tell you things. There's a backwards and forwards. You research, you learn things. It improves like the entire experience. Um, there is a, a blog post there. If, you can probably just Google four stages of programming shift to jelly if you want to find it, where I talk a little bit more about this. But I think that's a really important thing in the development world. Don't be too defensive about your own code. Don't be protective over it. Don't be afraid about showing it to people and getting feedback. Like one of the best things we do now is um, when I look at something, I'm like, this is not quite right. I'll just call the other developers in our team over and be like, hey, this doesn't look quite right. What do you people think? And they're like, oh, yeah, like this and that. And you end up with something way better. Like it's, it's way better than you going off like and being like, oh, how do I pick the optimal data structure for whatever and spending like four hours on, on that instead. And then maybe producing something that was insanely obvious and you just didn't realize. Um, so this is, this is from me, but it probably applies to you as well. This um, is very similar, actually. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is, I guess it is. So uh, w what I've found is that, that I've, I've written a lot of articles um, and I think in, in some respects, some of those articles, people probably maybe perceive me as, as an expert on a topic. Um, but what I've found is kind of the opposite. Um, so everyone thinks experts write articles, but what I've found is that I've actually learned so much by writing articles because I've had to publish it and, and you know, doing that is in, in some respects opening yourself up to criticism. Um, so I've usually researched really heavily, which then, because you've had to research it, it makes you look like you just knew this stuff. And you're like, yeah, I'll just write that out, you know, so everyone can read it. <laughs> but it's the exact opposite. I've actually learned by, by, by writing about it. So um, as much as when I started, uh, I started writing about design stuff and workflows, um, mostly because there was no other information and I was trying to explore it. But I, I was thinking that I was sort of hopefully helping other people, what I've kind of learned is that I've actually helping myself. I've, I've, I've learned to love myself is oh, what's happened. Yeah. So um, it's been a really positive experience for me. So it's, yeah, definitely something I'm going to, I'm going to continue doing. And um, yeah, I hope it is helping other people, but I've definitely realized that, that in, in, in writing, it's, it's making me a lot better at what I do, which is amazing. So it's, it's good. Yeah, definitely. And exactly the same thing with publishing code, like on open source projects and stuff, same, same principle. Um, I think this is one of our last points, and I'd like to say it's the, the most salient and most prescient, but it's just last in the slide deck because that's how we um, order things. <laughs> it's that you get this um, impression that if people often ask me, like, oh, you left full time employment, was that really stressful? It was, but in hindsight, it shouldn't have been because this industry that we work with in is like no other industry in the world. Like, you can go and try and do something, and if you fail, you can just go back to full-time employment. There are, there are literally jobs everywhere. Like, there are tons of companies vying for all sorts of developers, iOS developers, you know, server developers, all sorts of developers are in demand 
everywhere in Australia. It doesn't even matter if you come from little old Adelaide. Like we still employ um, tons of developers there. And I used to think that was a huge failure. Like, oh, what if everyone sees me, you know, go out on my own, and then six months later I have to shut the whole thing down and you know go back and take a full time job? Oh, everyone's going to think I'm a failure. It, it doesn't actually matter. I've seen ton tons of my friends that have been like, you know what, I've done this for five years. I've had enough. I'm going to go and get a full time job. There is no shame in that. Um, whatsoever. And the other one that's a big thing is um, I used to see all these people leaving independent development and they'd sell their company, let's say, for, I don't know, 500 grand, a million dollars, whatever it was. And it, you're like, oh, you, you sold out, man. We were living the independent dream. We were like the rock stars. And now you're working for the man, you know, like you're over in the US working for some giant company that, you know, everybody loves or hates or whatever. But even that's fine. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's your development career. And I don't think anyone else is judging you except for you sometimes, which is maybe that's the real message in, in all of this is that don't judge yourself so harshly. Like if you decide that you've had enough of independent development, you want to go full time. If you decide the opposite, you've had enough of full time development, you want to go independent. That's fine. This industry is full of like opportunities. Don't, don't be scared to make that jump either way. And don't worry about what all your peers will think because most likely they'll respect you like either way. It's not, you're often, I guess, your own harshest critic. And yeah, we had to get to this. You just have Absolutely. to choose the right, the right it's path the, for the moment. It's the intersection of success and failure. Um, but, <laughs> Mark found this on the internet and it was just too good not to put in this presentation. Yep. Um, someone out there is probably getting some hidden meaning for this. They're like, yes, that's the one thing I was searching for from this conference. You've, you've solidified my view on whatever it is. We, we confirm that view is true. We're almost at the end, I promise. Well, we are. Uh, this is something I kind of didn't get early on. I, uh, the the full-time jobs I had, I was um, always looking for kind of permission to, to do things and to, to learn. And what I've noticed, especially when we've been looking for people to work with, um, the people who are the, uh, I think, the ones that are the most attractive to us to work with are people who have gone out and just decided they're going to do something. So let's just say you're, you're into, you wanted to get into AR. You're like, oh, whatever job I'm in doesn't really have an AR component. I could try and pitch something to the boss or whatever else. Um, I think the, the best approach is kind of just to feel like you can do it yourself. You know, just, just, just go out and try some small project, uh, as we were talking about before, open source is a great way to do that and get into something. And again, by doing this, you by um, de facto, you will be an expert if it's a new field because uh, no one else is really doing it. So you end up with five years of swift experience if you started right on day one or whatever it is. Um, so the, yeah, I just think that, that really, if, if you think you want to learn something or you want to get into a certain field, the best way to actually do that is really just to start, start doing it. If you um, if you can't do it all yourself, then team up with someone else because there's plenty of designers and developers who are, have the other, other side of the, the coin there that really want to get into something. And yeah, they're usually looking for people to partner with. So definitely, that would be my advice. Don't ask for, for permission. Just, just go out and do it. Are we ready? Are we ready for this? You got to prepare yourself because this next one's good. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it's worth mentioning, as Tony said, that um, both of us have been involved in dev world sort of on and off, like in, in various things. And I'm amazed, 10 years, that, that is a big deal. So congratulations to Tony and the team. I just want to say that again. So have we got enough time for questions? Can we take five minutes? Sure. Has anyone got any questions? Yes. So the question was, I guess, how many marketing people should you have based on the size of your development team? Um, that's really hard to answer, but I guess the, the easy kind of cliched answer is that uh, marketing is not always just the marketing person's job. Like if you're a developer in a small company especially, it's kind of your job to do marketing as well. Like your own personal Twitter feed, your own blog, your own... If you have some kind of presence on the internet, then you're also part of the the marketing sort of efforts of your company. Like I don't know the specifics of the company that you work at, but it's not just you don't have a salesperson and they're the salesperson. It's often better if the whole team is kind of involved in it. Does it sound wrong to you if the marketing is bigger than the development team? Uh, sometimes no. That, that's the Oracle story, for example. Their marketing team is probably 12 times bigger than their yeah, sales team. Yeah, it depends on the product. I mean, for, for us, I, I, that's not something I would not, I would not give, up, give that up to someone else because I, it's, um, as, as Russell mentioned with the uh, building podcast for Android, um, that ended up being... Um, that was a very top level, that's a product vision question, but that ended up relating to marketing. 
So it's sort of like it's something that is, um, it can be deeply integral into every single decision. And, and uh, like our, our Twitter feed, I, I don't know if I'd be willing to give that up to someone. We're not big enough to have like marketing people, but um, I'd, I would struggle to let that go because a lot of the traditional marketing, I think for us doesn't feel right. So I don't, I don't know what the balance is. I mean, it's the same, same question, I guess, for products that have developers and designers. There isn't, I don't think there's an ideal ratio. It depends on the product and, and the team involved in what the right numbers are. It's, yeah. yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Yes, the man with the beard. The marketing guy lying down, was that meant to be a throwback to Jack? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it should have been. The Tanang. No, no. There, is, there is a Tumblr somewhere. I think it's the-tanang.tumblr.com. <laughs> what, what you find there is, um, yeah, it's magical. He now works at Apple, so that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, how oh, long do you spend yes. on your articles? Like when you, you just like how long do you spend? Does it take you to research and, and write an article? So the question was, how long do I spend on the articles? Uh, it really it depends. Um, some of them, I'm a really slow writer, which is one of my biggest issues, um, and, and also a lot of them require a lot of research. Some of them I've had drafts for years. Um, in fact, color management, I've got two I want to write, and they're not done, <laughs> um, and they've taken a long time. But some of them, some of them could be fairly quick, depending on what they are. Like if it's a, just a tip, here's how to do something. So some of them can be... How long do those magazine one takes? I, I know a few times you've been in Smashing Magazine or whatever it is. Oh, that took months. Months? Yeah, that was ridiculously long, because it was, yeah, just, yeah. just they require a lot of words and a lot of... Um, and also, it, because of where it gets published, I can't easily edit it if there's mistakes. Yeah. So okay. that's, yeah. Yep. Yes? Yeah, so uh, the, the question was like, um, did we run our company as a sole trader and at how long and did we switch? Um, yeah, for two years. Uh, the thing about being in Australia, I think I'm not a tax person, so don't take this as advice, but I'm pretty sure it's still the case that if you trade under your own name, it's free. Yeah, you just register that, you don't have to pay any money. And we- You have to pay any tax, is that what you said? You have to pay tax, of course. I mean, <laughs> you don't pay money to set up the business and we traded like that for two full years. So um, the way it would work is uh, Apple back then would pay me directly. And I just said, you know, Phil gets this percentage, the designer that works with us gets this percentage, and we just split up those percentages and they'd kind of manage their own finances. So we did that for a full two years while all of us were still employed. Um, the day we went full time though, this is different for everybody, but we decided to actually form a proper proprietary limited like company with directors and shares and um, various agreements and stuff. The reason we did that is I got a ton of advice from people that said, um, the one thing you want to make sure is when you're forming a company, especially with a partner, so I had a business partner who we went 50-50 with, um, it's, it's more, more serious than a marriage in many ways, like it's very hard to break apart and not only that, but you want everything to be written down. You're like, if Phil wants to leave and do his own things, here's exactly the conditions that happens under. If we want to issue more shares, here's exactly the conditions. You want to detail as much of that as you can up front, even if sometimes you feel like, is this company even going to be around in like a year? Like who the heck knows? Because our shares are worth a dollar each and we have like a thousand of them. So we're worth a thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's, you don't know, but it's better to, to plan for that. But don't be afraid of doing the whole sole trader thing initially. Like it's just talk to a tax person. It's pretty easy to, to set up. Uh, I just did that because it was a cheap cut. Like I didn't want to pay anyone any money, I guess. So the, the whole sole trading thing was like you don't have to, you just file like one piece of paper and you're a sole trader basically. Like it's, it's not hard to do. Can I just add on to that that you have to be careful definitely speak to a tax person and potentially a lawyer. Yes. Be a sole trader because you can open yourself up to liability. Like yeah, that is true. There was a, there, there was a whole series of like um, patent lawsuits and all sorts of other fun things that happened in the industry. One thing about being a sole trader is if someone does sue you, then potentially they can take all your assets. There you go. That's what I was getting. Yeah. I didn't want to give advice because I'm not the best. And again, neither of us are a tax lawyer. So go, go and see a tax person by, by all means. But that is the benefit of running a proper company is that they can take the company's assets, but they can't take your personal assets, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're a director of a company, you also need insurance against yeah. your, your, your mistakes made. Otherwise, seriously, you can speak to someone. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got, probably better wrap it up there because we need to switch over now for stream sessions again. Um, thank you, gentlemen. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.